Now, next, at Peter D. Donnelly. Uh, Peter Donnelly is, uh, is uh, going to be the last speaker on this uh, plenary, and I think it's fitting because what he'll be speaking about uh, this evening is really drawing this down to the individual level, but also what can be done. And, uh, you know, an incredible expert in the area of violence, literally the author of the textbook, the Oxford textbook on violence prevention. Uh, he also holds professorship, professorships at University of Toronto, St. Andrews University in Scotland. But his primary role now in Toronto is president and CEO of Public Health Ontario. There he leads a staff of over a thousand people dedicated to improving the health and reducing health inequalities for the province's 13.5 million residents. Uh, the, in the past 25 years, uh, Dr. Donnelly's had an incredible career in public health. He's had a series of increasingly senior academic and leadership positions in Wales, in Scotland, and now in Canada. As a professor of public health medicine at uh, St. Andrews, he established and led public health medicine research and teaching and as deputy chief medical officer to the Scottish government, provided senior leadership and coordination at a national level. He's worked in a broad range of public health issues and as director of public health in two jurisdictions, he was responsible for the del delivery of local public health services and programs. Graduated from Edinburgh Medical, Edinburgh Medical School and is an active researcher and lecturer in many areas. Uh, he's been involved in numerous national and international organizations, including the World Health Organization. So without further ado, to speak uh, to us last, and then we'll begin with our questions, uh, Peter Donnelly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Goodness, that sounds like the uh, CV of someone who needs to decide what they want to be when they grow up, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm only 53, so there's no rush, folks. Um, it's a great honor to be here to talk to you, a great honor to share uh, uh, the stage was was such uh, fantastic speakers. I could have talked to you about a number of things, but I think rather than risk repeating uh, some of the material that I used in a previous session where I majored largely on youth violence, I, I'm going to talk about something something different and do so fairly swift with so fairly swiftly. So bear with me on what might be a bit of a roller coaster ride. I'm going to talk a little bit about why violence matters in a health sense. I want to talk about the impact of violent childhoods, the importance of good parenting, why governments are remarkably shy about doing anything in the face of the evidence, and then share with you an idea that I'm just kind of thinking out loud on, and you can give me some feedback. And actually, listening to the other two talks, this all kind of fits together pretty well, so anyone would have thought this session had been planned. Um, <laughs> I have no commercial interest to declare. Um, if you ask even bright medical students, they don't get this right. You say, what are the big killers in the developing world? They get some of them, HIV, AIDS, they all get TB, malaria. The bright ones get road traffic accidents. Very few actually get violence, 1.5 million deaths a year. The ones who do get it think it's war, but as we've heard from a previous speaker, it's not. Uh, only about 150,000 to 200,000 deaths a year are actually from war. The rest are suicides and homicides. I used to put this up at St. Andrews. I used to take the top label off. I was a really mean professor, actually. I used to say, um, look, the, uh, the darker the country, darker the shading of the country, the more prevalent the condition, what is this? And of course, people would say TB or HIV AIDS. Or, these are all good guesses. But then they would move on to more and more esoteric tropical diseases. Uh, no, this is homicides. This is homicides. So homicide or murder, as we would say in Scotland, um, is a disease of poverty and inequality. So like many things in public health, homicide is a disease of poverty and inequality. The other thing that's really important to remember is that um, epidemiologists are kind of weird people. We like death just because it's easy to count. 
You know, you put two St. Andrew's medical students in a room with a dead body, body, they'll generally agree the person is dead. You put them in a room with a live patient, you'll probably get three different diagnoses, right? You know, the students will disagree and the patient will have a view. It's, it, it's much harder, much harder to look at morbidity than it is mortality. This really matters with violence because there's a huge amount of violence which is hidden. It's usually perpetrated on women and it's usually behind closed doors. And it's usually linked to psychological violence in terms of coercive control. If you're interested in a public health approach to violence, I recommend this report. It's the second uh, decennial report by the World Health Organization on this subject. Uh, it looks at every country and tries to assess the progress they're making. This is shameless advertising. It's not so much really of my editing or my much more talented colleagues, Kathy Ward's editing, but there are actually some really quite good articles in this by people who know a lot more about violence and violence reduction than I do. Anyway, linking poor childhoods and adult ill health. Here's a couple of really interesting characters, Vincent Felitti and Rob Ander. They are jointly the authors with a number of other people of something like 35 good quality peer-reviewed publications that show that if you have, if you experience a violent, neglectful, or otherwise abusive childhood, you will have very poor adult health. It is a terribly simple but effective methodology it all fits on one side of paper. It asks you the following questions. I won't read them out. You can probably, if you've got good eyesight, see them. But it wants to know whether you've been physically or sexually or psychologically abused, whether you lived in a household where there was a problem with alcohol or drugs, whether one or both parents was incarcerated. It turns out that these things are very, very strongly predictive of adult ill health. Here's just a graphical presentation of some of the more frequent adverse childhood experiences that people will relay if you present this question to them. And here's the things it causes. Now, I think some of these are fairly intuitive. I think I can understand why if you had an abusive childhood, you may be more likely to suffer from depression. Some of them are a bit harder. Why do you get more cancer, more ischemic heart disease, and more strokes? Well, to a certain extent, that is mediated by the use of tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. Some of it goes even beyond that, though, and it's something to do with the way that our hypothalamic pituitary access is set early in childhood. So there is a strong link between adverse childhood experiences and profound adult ill health. And when I spoke to Vincent about this and said, look, I understand how it might lead to depression, but I cannot, for example, understand why people with poor childhoods are more prone to have many sexual partners suffer sexually transmitted diseases to a higher extent and to have unplanned pregnancies, he came out with a very memorable phrase, which is he, say, he says, Peter, you have to understand there is nothing as seductive as the cure that almost works. Nothing as seductive as the cure that almost works. So maybe the next drink, the next shot of drugs, the next man or woman is going to be the person that makes you feel okay about yourself. It's a profoundly important thought in terms of the link between adverse childhood experiences and adult ill health. Well, what can we do about that? There's been quite a lot of good quality research in this area. The best thing we can do is help people parent as well as they possibly can. It's easier to prescribe than to do. 
But here are the some of the images of positive parenting that we would all realize. So it's positive, warm, and consistent parenting, interacting with the child, talk, play, praise, laugh, doing special things together, clear and consistent expectations, and using non-punitive consequences, non-violent consequences, to correct behavior. So we know what it is, and we know that there's some really good published evidence that shows that you can help people parent well, and that parenting well makes a difference. Now what's so interesting to me is that in the face of this evidence and some other evidence, and this is from Heckman, and this will be well known uh, to you all, this is a Nobel winning, Nobel Prize winning, winning economist who points out that the investment that one makes in childhood pays off many, many times over. If you invest in childhood and early learning, it pays off many, many times over in adult life. So in the face of the published evidence, both in terms of uh, the science evidence I've showed before, in terms of the economic evidence I show now, why is it that governments are quite so reluctant? And this is, why, this is how, either fortuitously or by design, by design, there's a rather nice crossover with the previous two talks you've just heard. It's pretty clear what governments should be doing but they don't like to invest in early years as much as they should. They don't like to invest in parenting. They don't like become, to become involved. And the reason is that they actually fear being condemned for what is often, at least in Western Europe, termed nanny statism. Now, nanny statism is when the state actually says something to you about the evidence, for example, on the link between drinking too much alcohol and ill health. And the popular press will say, there you are again. The state is being a nanny. The state is telling us what we should or shouldn't do. You can imagine there's nothing quite as emotive in terms of the accusation of being a nanny state as actually giving advice on parenting. So this is why they're so reluctant. They're terrified of being accused of nanny statism. I think the other reason is that although it does pay off, it means investing now for a payoff down the line. And that's tough for governments of all political persuasion to do. So that here's the trick. We need to think of a way of reconceptualizing parenting and helping people parent well and helping governments invest in the early years in a way that makes sense to them, that's intuitive, that they're prepared to defend. So here's an idea I'm just kind of toying with and I'd be very interested in your thoughts on this when we get to the discussion bit. Maybe good parenting is the social equivalent of vaccination. When we vaccinate our kids, we build up their resilience against the challenge of communicable disease. What can we do to build up the resilience of our children against the challenge of non-communicable disease? Perhaps good parenting is the equivalent. Why is that worth looking at as an argument? It's worth considering because governments actually promote vaccination even in the face of opposition. They stick to the science. They say, no, we believe that vaccination is the right and economical and proper thing to do. They don't back off when they face pressure. They stick to it. So maybe if we can help recast parenting, parenting education, a good start in life in a different way, 
Maybe that actually helps our politicians do the right thing. Um, I was working with one of my colleagues <laughs> looking for an image that would somehow personify good parenting. I rather liked the idea that the parent might be a man. I loved the idea that he would be a kind of macho guy with a beard and a tattoo. And I thought it was really cool that the little girl was putting lipstick on him. What neither uh, my colleague and I realized at the time was that even the color of the girl's uh, top and the lipstick and the thing that she's popped in the guy's hair kind of echoes the pink which was in the vaccination above. And so uh, we've started using this slide here that brings these two images together just to promote thoughtfulness in this area and to say maybe we need to think of reconceptualizing good parenting as the chronic disease equivalent of vaccination and perhaps that way help governments do the right thing. Thank you.